Hey, Dean Creek 8th grade students. Welcome to today's e-learning live stream. It is Friday, April 17th. Uh, let's jump into our daily e-learning updates. So to review, for yesterday, we had 44 out of 51 students who had submitted the attendance form in language arts yesterday, kind of right in line with where we've been for most of the week, which is great. Uh, as an update from the day before, we only, we only had one more person submit their animal farm quiz for chapters one through three. So we're up to now 36 out of 51. Um, obviously, you still have quite a few people, so I'm not going to go into details on those answers quite yet. Um, I will be sending out reminder emails again, just in general for work that's missing. So there will be people who get it for that quiz. Um, I have begun to go through and grade them. If I finish them, I'll be updating the grades either today or sometime this weekend, so you can keep an eye out for that as well. Um, for the optional vocab review from yesterday, we had 22 out of 51 students participate in that. That's awesome. Um, I'm, I'm happy to see a larger number of people taking the opportunity to potentially get that additional bump to their grade. And then for the social studies quiz from yesterday, we had 32 out of 51 students who had turned it in. Kind of right on par, it seems like where we've been with those. So again, if you're someone who knows that you didn't turn that in, uh, please get that turned in as soon as possible. All right, and then our plan for today, I'll introduce the Google Form, which was sent out in classroom. Uh, we'll be going over chapter four of Animal Farm today. And then yes, it is Friday. Thank goodness, although not like the weather's really cooperating. Um, but that means that it's Genius Hour Day in Language Arts. And then there is an optional writing response for Chapter 4. Um, I realize not a lot of people did the one for Chapter 3. I tried to cut this one back a little bit, make it shorter, and give you some choice. So if you were wanting, again, to take the opportunity, get some writing practice, bump your grade up, that is out there as well. And then for Social Studies, uh, we'll review the quiz from yesterday, and then there is just a short writing response for today. Uh, we're towards that. Well, we're at the end of our notes for the civil rights unit, so I thought that having a writing response about that for today, it's not an overly complicated one, um, would be better than doing another current events, especially because I'm sure a lot of you, like me, are tired of talking about the coronavirus. Everything's about the coronavirus. And I would say the high 90% of the news stories that I'm out there finding have to do with the coronavirus. So a little bit of a different plan than the last couple Fridays for that. All right, so here are the journal responses from yesterday. Uh, the 44 people who had turned them in at the time of making this video. What is the best time of day, morning, afternoon, or night? This is, this is exactly how I thought it would shake out. We had over 50% of the people say that they prefer evening or night. Um, and then we had about 32% of people say the afternoon, and then only 13.6% say the morning. I, when I was your age, would have 100% been with you as a night person. Um, I don't know how many of you remember hearing me talk. I feel like as I've gotten older, I become much more of a, mer a morning person. You know, even now on days where I could sleep in, in theory, as late as I want, I'm still finding myself getting up at 5, 5.30, trying to exercise, get things done uh, early on in the day. Um, but I figured most people would go with night, so that is exactly what happened. Um, Theo's wanting everyone to know you can make a snow cone from a snowball and some syrup. It's pretty good. Uh, I've never actually tried that. I'm admittedly a big fan of, of snow cones. Um, so for anyone who's looking for a tasty treat um, that also, you know, takes advantage of the fact that we're getting snow at the end of April, that is out there. I also want to give Theo a quick shout out. Uh, for those of you who didn't note, when we get to one of the other questions, um, he gave his take on it, which I'm sure will get a lot of people going. Um, so we'll be talking about that in a minute or so here. Um, so our second question from yesterday, which season do you prefer, spring or fall? Pretty close. Um, slightly more people go with fall over spring. Um, I think I would tend to agree with fall. I just enjoy the, the foliage, the changing of the leaves. It's also football season, um, which is a big plus for me. Not that I have anything against baseball in the spring, um, but I would prefer fall as well. And then finally, 
Um, we had burgers, pizza, or tacos for your go-to meal. Going back to Theo and his hot takes, he brought up the fact that pizza is the way to go because you can put pineapple on it. I'm sure there are a lot of you who have some pretty strong feelings one way or the other on that. Uh, but this was a pretty close race. Um, we had pizza and tacos both finishing at about 32%, and then burgers squeaking out the victory at about 36%. So a pretty even split. Um, I don't know if I could choose just one of these three. I think my I, my gut reaction, I think, would be pizza, but it would be really hard for me to give up burgers or tacos. Um, but yeah, so those are the journal highlights from yesterday, and there will be some new journal questions for today. So why don't we jump on over to our Google form and talk about what's going on there. Uh, part one for the Google form that was shared in classroom today, Animal Farm. Be talking about chapter four in a little bit here. There's the optional writing response. Um, again, as long as you answer the prompt fully, you'll get full credit, um, but you do need to give more than just a sentence or so answering the question. There is a choice of two questions, just pick one, um, but make sure you answer it fully. Then just a reminder, Genius Hour, that's the plan for today. There's still a handful of you who don't have your topics to me yet. Please let me know if you are one of those people once you've got it figured out. And then our attendance responses for today, which I'll be talking about on Monday. Uh, number one, how would you describe your perfect working situation? Are you gonna go on your own? Are you gonna go with a partner? Or are you gonna work in a group? I'm sure a lot of you have very strong feelings one way or the other. Um, but given, this is talking about your ideal working situation. So if you're working in a group, I would say you get to choose your group. Um, with a partner, obviously, you get to choose your partner. This isn't anything random, but obviously, I'm sure there are plenty of people who would still prefer to work solo. So perfect working situation is the first question. Second question, what type of everyday footwear do you prefer? Are you going with sandals or slides, something that's more open? Or are you going with shoes or sneakers or whatever the verbiage is? that you use for that type of footwear. Um, Crocs people, I'll let you decide where your footwear falls, if that's the one that you're wanting to go with, because um, I could see arguments either way, um, or just think about between the other options, which way you go, in, sandals or slides, or some type of shoes or sneakers. I'm sure most of you can guess where I would fall on this one. And then finally, you can only save one type of French fries. Which one are you going with? Curly fries? regular or like crinkle cut fries or waffle fries. I debated whether or not to put potato wedges in here, but then I felt like opening it up to one. I mean, it doesn't have the name fries in it. And I felt like the more options I opened up, the more I also could then include as well. So out of those three, which one are you saving to eat for the rest of time? All right, so that's the Google form for today. Um, let's jump over to Animal Farm and to chapter four which was looking at the battle of the cow shed. This was the main event in chapter four. It took up a lot of the chapter, shortest chapter in the book, um, but still packed full of things going on. So for our summary, uh, news of Animal Farm begins to spread around the country. Mr. Jones continues to live in Willingdon where he drinks a lot and complains to other farmers about his situation. The men who own the farms next to Animal Farm, Mr. Pilkington and Mr. Frederick, are afraid that word will reach their animals and start rebellions on their own farms as well. Now, Frederick and Pilkington hate each other, so they are unwilling to work together against Animal Farm, and instead they just spend their time spreading lies about life on Animal Farm being poor and immoral. They say that it's going to fail, that the animals are all beasts, that they don't have food and all these sorts of things. However, many other animals around the country are able to learn beasts of England and this leads to some instances of these animals acting out. There are no full-out rebellions on these other farms but there are examples of animals that are acting out, um, doing things that are out of character, you know, not obeying their masters and things like that. Um, but in terms of full out revolutions or rebellions, there's nothing really of that sort going on. And then in early October, 
Mr. Jones leads an assault on the farm. Okay, he's back. He's got some men from Pilkington and Frederick's farms, and he is coming back to try and regain control of Animal Farm. Now, Snowball, who has spent time studying defensive battle tactics, he mentions Julius Caesar as one of his inspirations. Snowball leads the animals against the men's attack. Now, the men are quickly defeated um, because of particular acts of heroism from Boxer and Snowball. And for their acts, both of these animals are given a medal, naming them Animal Hero First Class. Now, during the defense of the farm, a single sheep does die, and it appears that Boxer accidentally killed a human. Boxer feels very bad about what he has done, saying he didn't mean to take anyone's life, but Snowball assures him not to feel guilty, and it turns out later that the boy was only stunned, and he runs away later on in the chapter. Uh, at the end, the animals bury the sheep. They name the battle the Battle of the Cowshed, and it is decided that Mr. Jones's gun, which they find left on the ground, is going to be fired off twice per year. Once to remember the Battle of the Cowshed, and once on Midsummer's Eve to commemorate the date of the revolution. So the two main characters that are introduced in Chapter 4 are the two men who control the farms next to Animal Farm. So we have Mr. Frederick, who owns a farm called Pinchfield. Pinchfield is a small, well-kept farm, and Frederick is described as a very tough, shrewd man who is perpetually involved in lawsuits and with a name for driving hard bargains. I can give you a hint. Um, Frederick is an allegory for a historical figure that you are all very familiar with. You know, if you're thinking about humans as being in controls of farms, as similar to rulers of different countries, that can give you a hint to Mr. Frederick representing some other ruler in this time period of another country. And then same can be said for Mr. Pilkington. He is the owner of a farm called Foxwood. Foxwood is a much larger farm, but it is somewhat in disrepair. And Pilkington is said to be just an easygoing gentleman farmer who spends most of his time hunting or fishing. Um, so again, Pilkington represents another ruler or um, president type figure from history who controls another country as well. And remember, these two men both cannot stand each other, which is part of why they are unable to come together to fight against Animal Farm. So now for some important quotes from chapter four. Um, this first one from page 13. They were both thoroughly frightened by the rebellion on Animal Farm, again, talking about Frederick and Pilkington, and very anxious to prevent their own animals from learning too much about it. At first, they pretended to laugh, to scorn the idea of animals managing a farm for themselves. They put it about that the animals on the manor farm, which it's noted they refused to call it animal farm, were perpetually fighting among themselves and were also rapidly starving to death. When time passed and the animals had evidently not starved to death, Frederick and Pilkington changed their tune and began to talk of the terrible wickedness that now flourished on Animal Farm. All right, so just a idea of what these neighboring farms think about and what they're saying about life on Animal Farm. At first they say that they're starving to death, then it's clear that no, they're actually doing all right. Um, they in, instead just spread rumors about all of the wicked things that are happening on Animal Farm. Continuing on with that, our next important quote, it's a pair from page 14. Uh, rumors of a wonderful farm where the human beings had been turned out and the animals managed their own affairs continued to circulate in vague and distorted forms, and throughout that year, a wave of rebelliousness ran through the countryside. And then a little bit later, it said that above all, the tune and even the words of Beasts of England were known everywhere. When the human beings listened to it, they secretly trembled, hearing in it a prophecy of their future doom. All right, so in conjunction with the prior quote, it's clear that the word getting around to the different animals on the farms of the countryside is very positive in regard to Animal Farm, and that human beings are beginning to fear beasts of England as a sign of their potential downfall, that their animals are going to rebel, that they're going to be overthrown, 
and out of power. So reinforcing the power of beasts of England and the fact that this rebellion on Animal Farm is beginning to grow legs, excuse the pun. Um, this next set of quotes is from the end of the Battle of the Cowshed, where Boxer realizes that the boy that he struck with his hoof um, it appears to be dead. And so it is, he is dead, is said Boxer sorrowfully. I had no intention of doing that. I forgot that I was wearing iron shoes. Who will believe that I did not do this on purpose? No sentimentality, comrade, cried Snowball, from whose wounds the blood was still dripping. War is war. The only good human being is a dead one. I have no wish to take life, not even human life, repeated Boxer, and his eyes were full of tears. I thought this was just an important moment of characterization for each of these two characters. Boxer, obviously, this very strong, large beast, but at the end of the day, a very gentle heart and one who does not want to take things to such an extreme that he's actually taking the life of another living thing. Whereas Snowball, who, as it says, was injured in the battle, he is saying that war is war and the only good human being is a dead one. So just a, a difference in opinion between one of the pigs in Snowball and then Boxer, just kind of drawing the comparison between those two characters. All right, and then finally, um, no changes to the side of the barn in chapter four, um, but this is what it is looking like. Still has four legs good, two legs bad at the top, and then the list of seven commandments at the bottom. I promise that, not to spoil anything, but you will see this change as the story moves forward. Um, but in terms of in chapter four, nothing changes. All right, so that's all for chapter four for Animal Farm. Um, and then your assignment for language arts today is to be working on your Genius Hour project. And as you can see here, um, we have, oh no, those are the uh, Genius Hour number one topics, but we still have um, a handful of people who, I guess I'm gonna have to look at this in my drive. Um, I wanna say we still have seven or eight people who do not have their Genius Hour topic sent in yet. So if you know that you are one of those people, um, please make sure that you get that topic figured out and emailed to me. And actually, you know what, I can tell that um, my Chromebook is just gonna run too slow to, to go through all this. So I will be emailing those of you who are still owing me a topic today. Um, but if you are one who has gotten your topic cleared and it's, it's all good to go, then just spend your language arts time today working on that. Hopefully you have your research done or just about done and are getting ready to start your actual creation of whatever the presentation is that you're giving. All right. Um, so this is the quiz from Civil Rights Section 5. We had 32 people who turned it in. Looks like we are still at that number right now. Um, so just to go over, first question, the Equal Pay Act aimed to make sure that it was women were paid equally in the labor force. Um, the leader of Hispanic American labor groups during their fight for equality was a gentleman named Cesar Chavez. Uh, life for Native Americans leading into the 1960s, there were a number of different ways that you could go, but essentially they had had their lands taken from them, their life expectancy was incredibly short, um, the U.S. government was trying to tear apart tribal governments and force Native Americans to join the rest of American society, uh, just, you know, in general, any of those areas um, would get you the full point. And then finally, one right given to Americans with disabilities during this time. Um, they increased the educational rights of children with disabilities. They increased the expectations in terms of how accessible buildings and, and hiring practices would be. Um, so just a number of different rights that were given to Americans with disabilities. As long as you got one of those, you're good to go. All right, and then your social studies assignment for today um, civil rights reflection. There are two statements here given at the top. They're italicized. The first one says an individual is powerless to change society. And the second 
second one is an individual has the power to change society. And so the question is, using your knowledge of the civil rights movement, which statement do you feel is most true in respect to this time period? So you're asked to give a multi-sentence, well-supported response. Do you think that one person, an individual, has the power to change society or can one person not really do that much? So think about some of the major figures from this time that we've learned about so far it could be Rosa Parks, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X. Um, did they truly change society on their own or do you feel like it was more of a group effort? All right, um, as long as you explain your thinking, that's what matters most here. And then just a preview for next week, we will actually be going into a assignment where you're gonna get to look into the lives of some of the lesser known, um, but very important figures of the civil rights movement. Learn more about their lives, um, which I feel like is very important because it's often portrayed as this time period where there's a handful of people at the head who are leading everything, and that's not really the case, um, as you'll see with that. All right, so reflection here for social studies, genius hour for language arts, and then for those of you who are interested, we'll jump back to our optional assignment for today. Um, this was set in Google Classroom. It is a writing response on chapter four from Animal Farm, and it says answer one of the two prompts listed below. So the first one talks about how neighboring farmers are frightened by the rebellion on Animal Farm. They want to prevent their own animals from learning about it. And the question is, what era of history is this an allegory of? So it, as a hint, think back to the social studies unit we had from the Roaring Twenties and Great Depression. Um, there was a anxiety of a certain way of thinking, a certain way of government spreading amongst different groups of people. Um, there was a two word phrase that we talked about where the first word is a color that is associated with that type of thinking in government. Um, and then just why do you feel this way? Use details from history and details from the story. And then the second option is this chapter describes the battle of the cow shed. What event in history is this an allegory of? Uh, and you can look back over the Russian Revolution, the Russian Revolution Prezi notes if you need help. My biggest hint would be look at the date in October, and that should give you a hint about looking for something to do with October as well um, in terms of the Russian Revolution in general. All right, and then it just says explain the connections you can make between the historical event and the Battle of the Cowshed. All right, so that is just optional for those of you who would like to do it. Shorter than our response for chapter three, hopefully that means more people will choose to put in this extra work to try and boost their grade. But you know, I also understand it's Friday and hopefully everyone has something fun planned for the weekend. All right, um, otherwise, any questions, anything like that, as always, please feel free to email me um, and I will do my best to help you out with whatever questions you might have. Otherwise, I hope everyone has a wonderful and enjoyable weekend. Uh, we'll be back next week again for another week of e-learning. Um, again, I appreciate all the work that everyone's doing, keeping up with their assignments, getting things in. Um, hopefully, this will be the last week that we have to worry about it, um, but we'll obviously have to wait for more word until anything official comes out. Um, but in, until Monday, everyone have a great weekend. And this has been Professor Blazek signing off.